Welcome back to our study called My Foot Slips, and we're looking at Genesis chapter 16, and we're just wrapping this up today, asking some questions here, thinking about some things. So, uh, as we looked at the story, it is clear that there seemed to be some foot slipping going on here. Abram, Sarai, uh, definitely, and, you know, the ground that uh, Abram had made in his walk with God seemed to be on shaking ground. You know, it seemed like, okay, you know, you advanced, you, you trusted God to go and defeat this army, you, you did all these great things, and now what, Abram? Now, because the promise hasn't happened yet, you're, you're slipping a little bit? Well, we don't know the motivations of Abram's heart, but his actions showed that the amount of trust he had placed in God was not enough to allow him to wait on God, but it was easily swayed by his wife. So, his trust was not enough to stop the mistreatment of Hagar, or to correct his wife, or to stop him from taking Hagar as a wife. You know, he was walking on slippery ground here. But Abram could have easily sung Psalm 94, 18. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. Right, that, that could have been Abram's song right there. My foot slipping, whoa, 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 you know, but, and I yeah, did some dumb things here, but Lord, you held me up. You, you, you intervened. You corrected these things. You, you, you worked everything out for good, even though I was messing things up. Even though I wasn't going according to your will, and I went going you know, according to my will, you still fixed things. You held me up. So Abram could have sung that. Well, let me turn to uh, Charles Spurgeon. He, uh, you know, obviously one of the greatest preachers ever. He, he's the goat of preachers. Um, but uh, let me say, let me quote from him. He kind of wrapped this thing up. So here's what he said. One of the marks of a child of God is that although he sins, he does not love sin. He may fall into sin, but he is like a sheep, which if it tumbles into the mud is quickly up again, for it hates the mire. The sow wallows where the sheep is distressed. Now, we are not the swine that love the slaw, though we are as sheep that sometimes slip with their feet. Uh, Spurgeon continues here. He says, Sin is a powerful enemy, and if you are a child of God, you will have to fight against it. Every sin has to be slaughtered. Not a single sin is to be tolerated. Off with their heads and drive that sword into their hearts. They are all to die. Not one may be spared. Our Lord Jesus will not share his dominion even with an angel, much less with a sin. If you have iniquity enthroned in your heart, you must be lost. You may have Christ and leave your sin, but you cannot have Christ and hug your sin. Christ shall help you slay your sin. But if you say, no, but I will indulge this evil, is it not a little one? you will perish in your iniquity. If there is one darling sin that you would spare, Christ and your soul will never agree. There can be no peace between you and Christ while there is peace between you and sin. You have to overcome and destroy the sin for which you claim toleration. Mark that. You must not, you dare not, all eh, allow any sin to master you. And if it does overpower you, do not therefore claim that you may indulge it, but draw an inference of the opposite sort. Because it has mastered you, concentrate your entire strength upon its utter destruction. That's what Spurgeon said that we ought to do, and it's, it's a great quote. So, as we walk this path, our feet may slip. That's, that's what happens. We're sinners. We have sin in our heart. Maybe we haven't fought against sin hard enough, or maybe there's a sin that we're still we're focusing all that energy on to destroy, like he says. But uh, we may have to get up. We might fall down. We might get knocked over, but we have to get back up and start the fight again. But we always have to remember what Christ has done. Hebrews 10, 14, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Sanctification is a process. It's something we go through. We see that in the life of Abram. He's not perfect. He's not, he's not Jesus. Only Jesus was perfect. Only Jesus didn't need to be sanctified. 
Everyone else needed to be sanctified. Everyone else needed to be changed. Everyone else will be changed. All those, all those followers of God, from Abram to even David and all those other um, men of God that were just struggled in their life. Jonah needed to be changed, right? <laughs> Uh, Daniel needed to be changed, great man of God. Joshua, great man of God, needed to be changed, needed to be sanctified, needed to fight against his sin. There was a sin of fear and doubt in there, boom, he had to go after it and kill it. And uh, those, all those reminders are in there. So, yeah, we need to remember that this, this passage here where, where Abram is not doing what he's supposed to do, he's, he is sin by, he's sinning by not being a good husband. And Sarai is sinning because she comes up with a scheme uh, of using the cultural, you know, appropriating culture for her own use so that she could just have a child, not to think about what that would do to her husband or to her servant. And then her servant uh, rebels against Sarai and, and holds it over her and is arrogant and uh, is mean to... Uh, to Sarai, and and so you have all that going on, and it just makes you, it just makes you think. Wow, you know these people, real people, real sinners, real struggling with their faith, and uh, that's that's us. You know we struggle with our faith too. There's points points in our life where man, I'm doing great, and there's other things like I got to go to war. This sin is, it, I got to go and cut its head off. You know I got to destroy this thing. I gotta concentrate my energy on this, go after it, and and not let it alone until I kill it. Uh, that's that's where we need to be at with our sin. So Abram, Hagar, and Hagar and Sarah learned lessons here and things that they'll have to grow in. Things we'll see them grow in, but they're just like us, people that God chose uh, to give His mercy, His grace upon, and to sanctify, to change over time. So that's their story, and that's the story of. This passage of Genesis, hopefully you learned something, uh, hopefully you're encouraged by this, as you should be, and hopefully it pushes you to go and attack your sin today.